Hey, everybody, welcome back. Devin, the OG, the original Grognard. That doesn't look like a war game. Huh. Oh, that's right. This isn't a war game. <laughs> I amuse myself, which is good because I'm about the only one that seems to amuse myself on a regular basis. This is Silverton, a game of Colorado railroading. This is, a lot of people would call it a... And I mentioned this before, I despise the term Ameritrash game. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. It's an American style game. I mean, it's like a Euro style game. It's it's kind of a co-op game. But this is a kind of an old one. I mean, there have been co-op games for as far back as long as I can remember where you're not really competing against each other. Uh, everybody thinks this is this is kind of a newer phenomenon when the Euro style games, the Euro co op games started coming out. Like, nah, 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 nah. I got a, I got a copy of Stocks and Bonds right there from Avalon Hill back in the '60s. That's kind of a co op game. Well, it's not really co. It's a Stocks and Bonds game. There's no conflict there. Really, you can't mess with somebody. And I've got uh, Source of the Nile from Avalon Hill. That's 1976. That's that's a co-op game. Well, it's not really a co-op game, but you're not really competing against each other. You're just going out there, trying to find stuff, get victory points, and try to win the game in a group setting. I mean, this, this is not new. Um, and I don't know why a lot of those... I, again, a lot of people call them Euro Trash, Ameritrash, whatever. I, I hate those terms. All right, they're a game style you don't like. Then don't play them. Yeah, whatever. Don't bag on the people that do. Most Euro-style America, America co-op games are crap, but there are some good ones out there. Um, and we may be... I may be doing a video on what my current favorite ones are. See, I just don't play all war games. But this is Silverton. This is, this is, this is kind of a game that, that has a little bit of... Uh, it, it holds a special place in my heart because, for the most part, it covers western Colorado, and I grew up in Denver, so <laughs> I lived in Denver for like nine years uh, when I was a child. Uh, well, just outside Denver. It was a farm that my uncle, or my uncle owned. Uh, and I lived on the farm for, geez, I don't know, four or five years before we moved into suburbia. I, I'm a country boy. I grew up on a farm. I got no problem with that. But, I mean, this is all this is all Colorado area. Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and then you get down into New Mexico with Santa Fe, Taos, Alvado, and, you know, we got Aspen, Leadville, Fairplay, Dillon. And you go over here, it extends kind of into, into Utah, Salt Lake City, and uh, Eureka, Price, Sunnyside, Marysville. This is kind of minimalistic on the graphics. I mean, they don't even have the lines separating the states. This is, this is what you would call bare minimum graphics. I'm even surprised that it has, you know, the different colors on it for what the different... Uh, towns, what their mining specialty was. Um, you know, a knee-jerk initial reaction. I mean, take a look at the box cover. I mean, this is not, you know, something that looks like it's a modern-day game. And the components are, I mean, these are some of the cards. There's not a lot of graphical effort or graphical know-how that went into these. Um... <laughs> take a look at the quality. This is the this is the, the 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 Monopoly money, and it's printed on newsprint, just kind of like Monopoly money. Let's take a look at the rule book. I mean, look at this type print. Look at this type set. This looks like it came right off of an old, you know, manual typewriter with the carbon tape and everything. This is this is something I'd expect from something like uh, uh, Metagame Concepts in, in the late '70s and early '80s. But no, this this game actually came out in 1991. Yeah, Two Wolf. That's the company, maker of board games. You're not going to find any information out there on, on these guys. Um, I think 
They only did two games. Uh, this was one of them, and the other one they did was an expansion for this one, which expanded, I think it was New Mexico. And I think it was an expansion that expanded down here off of the New Mexico area. Um, it's the only two games the company ever did. And I think it was done by two brothers, because both of the designers have the same last name, and I can't even take up any information on those guys. And yeah, the company was in California. Mayfair picked this up in 94, I think it was, and reprinted it with pretty graphics and, you know, state lines on here so you could see. But yeah, I, this, 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 this was, I, I gotta applaud the guys. I think this was all done in their garage. And you got, I gotta give props to guys who are trying to trying to launch a game on their own, and try to do something with it. Uh, but yeah, this is <laughs> this is some bare bones. And honestly, at the end of the day, eh, I don't care. Uh, the, if the game plays good enough, I can overlook the graphics of anything. If you gotta rely on graphics to sell your game, you probably don't have that good of a game. Do graphics help a good game? Yes. Does it enhance a good game? Yes. Do graphics make a good game? No. So, and I guess because since I'm old school, and again, this is something I'd see at a, something like Metagame Concepts or, or oh my God, what, uh, Simulations Canada. They didn't do very much in the way of graphics either. Even the old, the old uh, strategy and tactics, SPI stuff was, you know, four color, bare minimalistic, Lucky if you had, I mean, even the old, old stuff that SPI did didn't even have uh, graphics on the counters. It was just, let's take a look at their original Sixth Fleet. Oh, just name of the ship and the stats on it. Didn't even bother to put a silhouette of the ship on it. So if you're turned off, if you need graphics to play, you're probably not going to like this very much. One of, the, one of the other reasons I like this, other than it being centered in a place that I hold near and dear to my heart, having grown up in, in Denver like I did, um, it's a really good solo game. I mean, it, it honestly probably makes a better solo game than it does a multiplayer game. And, you know, it tells you to start... There's a couple different solitaire scenarios. You start off in Denver, you have so much money, and, and how, long it take, how long it takes you to make, you know, X amount of cash, depending on the scenario you play. As a multiplayer game, it starts to fall off a little bit. If you got two players, then both people start off in Denver or one in Denver and Salt Lake City. But the problem is Denver has got a huge bonus. Even if you go up to like five people or six people, two people in Denver, you can put one in Pueblo, one in Santa Fe, and one or two up in Salt Lake City. <coughs> I've noticed most of the times if you're starting off in Denver, you're probably going to win the game mostly because you have a lot of the rich gold and silver mines in the area that's real easy for you to get to. I mean, Pueblo can put up a good fight. They can kind of get to range of some of these as well rather easy. Uh, Santa Fe, Santa Fe's right out. I mean, Santa Fe, you've got lumber. You've got an ass ton of lumber. And you got coal. You've got some coal. But you're not going to make a lot of money off of lumber and coal. And, I mean, honestly, the closest to Santa Fe I think you got is Silverton. And they really don't have much in the way of rich mines. Although they can get to Lake City and Ore and Telluride. Um, but, again, and uh, Salt Lake City is just, just screwed, period. I mean, there's one gold mine up there, Bingham. they got a couple silver mines. But, yeah, the rest of it's all... You know, coal. I mean, coal even makes less than lumber does. So, And the other reason that Denver has a huge advantage to it, if you to kind of take a look at those cards, not only is the entire basic idea of the game is you're getting out, you're getting claims, you're mining the claims, and then you're building the lines to the claims to transport the materials back to your city so you can sell them and make money at it. That takes effort. Um, however, there's also passenger lines. And you've got all these different passenger lines that if you complete a set of a, a, a set of tracks to that city, you can pick that up, and that's guaranteed income every turn. So, like, if you build Denver to Boulder, Denver to Boulder, I mean, that's one track length. It doesn't take much to get there. 
You know, it's going to cost you 400 to build it, but that's guaranteed income every turn. That's 100 every turn. And if you look at all the ones starting off, Leadville, Denver, Denver, Boulder, Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, Santa Fe, Salt Lake City, Provo, Denver, Pueblo. I mean, you're looking at a lot of cash. And as the game goes on, as you as you purchase these lines, you reveal more and more passenger lines under them. But Denver can make a lot of money off of passenger lines. That's why if it's a multiplayer game, you need to put two people in Denver so they are fighting over all that massive amount of potential income that they get as 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 the debt gets deeper as you purchase up those passenger lines more expensive lines but i mean even though by the end of the game i think one of the richest lines you can eventually get is salt lake to denver which is like three thousand a turn really tough to get to because you got a lot of distance you got to get to before you can open up that line and it costs a lot of money to open it but you know the game is set in multiplayer 24 turns you know, you start off in the first three or four turns, and if you're Denver, and say you grab Boulder, Colorado Springs, even Pueblo, you know, that's 800 a turn. Say it takes you four or five turns to get that. You're going to be collecting that income for 20 turns. You know, that's almost a th- that's $20,000 over the length of the game that the other cities like Salt Lake City and, and Pueblo and Santa Fe just doesn't start out with. Um, so if you're going to play this multiplayer, and like I said, it can go up to six players. Um, you put the more experienced player out in like Salt Lake City or, or down in Santa Fe and put the new players in Denver. Because just, just because of the location, whoever starts off in Denver has more of an advantage. Um, so basically what it is, is you're building, building rail lines. And I actually love games like this. Anything that has to do with trains, I just absolutely adore. I've probably got a half a dozen different train games on my Steam account. You know, Sid Meier's Rail Tycoon, Rail Empires, you know, whatever it is. I just, I just love, I love trains. Well, I love Steam trains. But basically the whole whole point of the game is you're, you're trying to buy up these claims. And the claims have got the, the, the city where they're located at what type of uh, material they produce. And there's only four materials in the game. There's gold, silver, lumber, and coal. And it actually has got a pretty good mechanic for adjusting adjust, adjusting the market. Probably one of the other aspects of the game I really like. Um, it all comes into how much is being put into the market, plus some randomization, plus demand that builds up over time. Uh, but you're also limited by how much each player can 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 transport a turn now gold there's no limit on gold <laughs> any player could do as much gold as they want denver same way with silver there's no limit uh salt lake city yeah, only each player can only put three units of silver into salt lake city each turn and then you know denver can take 10 lumber per person salt lake city can take eight pueblo six you know santa fe and so on and so forth so what you're trying to do is when you're playing a multiplayer game, you got six of these claim cards that are put out every turn, and you roll, you basically determine randomly who goes first. And each player has got a survey and a prospector. Now there are different values that you can have better surveys, or surveyors, and prospectors, depending on how many points you want to put into them. Surveyors are for building track line. Prospectors are for claiming uh, deeds. Uh, and so basically the first player, he puts down his, where he wants to put his track first, and it's got to be connected to his, his home city or an existing track. So say you have a player in Denver, say he wants to go to Boulder, you know, he puts, he puts the, he puts the marker right there on the trail that leads to Boulder. And so he's going to be trying to survey the tracks to get that. Now, any player who comes after him, they can also put a surveyor marker down on there to try to beat the other player and then you got to roll some dice and whoever rolls highest wins and whoever rolls lowest loses and doesn't get anything so you can only build one layer of track one one length of track a turn so unless it's something you really want most people don't really go for trying to trying to beat each other out of out of a survey position because if you lose well you don't get to build a length of track and that sets you back a little bit um but that's why you put the you know two people in 
in Denver because there's multiple ways for for people in Denver to go. And then, of course, if you are able to, if you do win it, then, you know, you got to pay the amount of 400 And now you put your colored shit there saying that you own that track to Boulder. The length is determined. I, it's just an arbitrary, well, it's not an arbitrary number, but it's, it, that comes into uh, uh, determining the, um, what am I thinking, passenger routes. Uh, if you want to build passenger routes, passenger routes go on uh, how long the track is. So if there was a passenger route between Boulder and Denver, it's, it's a length of three. And then it would be, you know, whatever times, distance times, whatever for how much cash. So if you wanted to build from Salt Lake City, a passenger line from Salt Lake City, you'd have to count up depending on which way you go. You know, you go here, here you know go through here but you have to count up all those distances that you're that you're laying the track and then multiply it by whatever the base is and that determines how much it's going to cost you so a passenger line can get real expensive if you have to go a real funky way of getting there but the, so that's the surveyors and the prospectors what the prospectors do is that after the first player's art is laid down as surveyor then you've got six of these cards out there and he decides which one of these <clears throat> claims that he wants to go for and you know the price is right there if he, so you know you got the six of them laid out there are random event cards as well but there's only like four of them in the deck of like 64 so they most of the time when they come up when you're playing them out it's just re reshuffle everything back in uh, but there is a mechanic where if you don't like anything else that's out there you can take your prospector and just stick them on the discard pile or on the on the deck and you draw the top card and if you get unfortunate enough to draw one of the events <laughs> prospector mysteriously disappears pay 500 next turn to hire a new one and put this card to the bottom of the deck or if drawn as an up card in other words you're refilling the thing uh discard this card put all undisputed up cards on the bottom of the deck and draw new cards so yeah that's kind of a way of of cycling through cards quickly <clears throat> but you put your the first player puts their prospector on whichever one he wants. And you go through the turn. Second player puts out his surveyor, prospector, yada, yada, yada. At the end of the turn, you know, whoever's, if, again, if multiple people have got prospectors on a claim, you dice off on it. And whoever gets the highest gets the opportunity to pay for the claim. Now, like I said, you can have some better prospectors. Like that's a prospector time plus two it means you get plus two on your dice roll. There's plus ones and plus twos. Um, but again, unless you really want to fight over a claim, you don't want to do that because then you the, the loser doesn't get anything. But so if the person, you know, if there's only one person on it, so all right, claims. Okay, so it costs him seven hundred to buy the claim. Well, what exactly does that mean? That means he now has a claim for silver. In Silverton. And if you look at the map, where's Silverton? That should be southeast. Where's Silverton? Where is Silverton? It's not Leadville. Leadville was Silverton, but it changed its name. And then the regular Silverton opened up in southeast. Or if I completely got my, my geography wrong, I may completely have my geography wrong. And I'm probably looking at it, and I'm completely missing it. Oh, there it is right there. Yeah, Silverton, Southeast Colorado. Yeah, right there. <coughs> so that means I own a silver mine that's in Silverton. There could be multiple claims in a city. It doesn't – see, Silverton is mainly listed as a gold town, but there are silver mines there as well. So what it means is every turn, if you want to operate it, it costs you 200 to operate it, but you got to roll 2d6 to see how much you actually get from it. So, and on the first turn, the first turn you operate it, you always get a bit of a bonus. So it's just a single D6 plus six. So now what does that mean? Well, if you roll a two through five, the mine's depleted, which means the mine's gone bust. You're not getting anything more out of the mine. You roll a six or a seven, you get a half a, half a unit of silver. Eight to nine, you get one unit of silver. 10 to 12, you get one and a half units of silver. And you've got these counters over here. This is for, this is for lumber. And you just put, we got the silver, and they've got one-halves in there. 
and there's another half. But you just put on the on the on the card how much you get. And if it's depleted, you put a depleted marker on it because you don't really get rid of it uh, if it's if it's got materials on it. Now there are occasions, there are mines, usually gold mines, that even on the first turn it has a chance of depleting. Let's see if I can find one. Silver and gold have the highest chances of depleting. Yeah, like right here. Aspen silver mine. On a two to eight, it depletes. So even on the first turn, you purchase this, you get a D6 plus six. <laughs> this mine could still deplete on you on the first turn. Uh, but you'll also notice for like coal and lumber, you can get a lot of coal and lumber out of them. It's just coal and lumber isn't worth that much on the, as much on the open market. So now what does that mean? You get a whole bunch of counters on it. You can do this every turn. Even if you don't have a rail line attached to that mine, you can generate it and it will stay on the card every turn that you keep rolling. You choose to pay the operating costs every turn until it depletes. Or you open up a line there and can transport everything that you've got on the card back to your city. So it's kind of a good idea in the early game. You want to look for mines that are near your home city and mines that are profitable. So like at the very beginning of the game, if, you know, again, I was in Denver and for some reason I decided to prospect the Silverton, would be a dumb idea. I'm going to have to run a rail line through whatever means out to Silverton. And then once I connect up, then I can transport everything that's been accumulating on the mine back to my hometown. And I can cash it out and get money for it. So obviously, you know, <laughs> if you're in Denver, you're probably not going to want a Silverton. Aspen, Aspen would not be bad. A silver mine in Aspen, not too tough to get to. I mean, it's one, two, three, four, five. So it take you, it would take you five turns to get to Aspen. And, of course, you know, it cost you 600 to there, 1500 there, 700 1000 or 800 depending on which track, and then another 1800 Wow. So, but that, that's how that works. With passenger lines, you have to have the, the existing lines before you can claim them. With the mines, the, 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 the claims, you don't have to. You can, there's, it's possible that you can pull a claim or, or buy a claim, but for whatever reason, never get a rail line hooked up to it and never get any income from that claim. So you always want to keep an eye on what's around and close to you that you can get to, especially in early game. I mean, like I said, in the multiplayer in the in the six player game, you got twenty four turns. It is conceivable to build a line between Salt Lake City and Denver. I mean, even going the long way above one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's probably the shortest route is you know ten track lengths to connect Silver uh, Salt Lake City to Denver. It's possible. But by the same token, if you want to go, you know, kind of a long way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so ten, eleven that way. But if you if you're forced to go even further south, so you can see the difficulties of it. Um, and like I said, connecting Salt Lake City to Denver is not bad. Like I said, if you can do that, you pick up the passenger line, and that's three thousand a turn. Which is that's yeah, that's a hefty amount. Now that's just and and each turn, um, you can transport all the resources from two mines back to your hometown. So if you've got you know er, early game, you're probably going to get one. You're going to get your first mine connected. Then maybe a turn or two later, you're going to get your second mine connected. But you can only transport from two uh, claims back to your hometown. Now that's in the basic game. In the advanced game, you can buy upgraded engines and the value you start off the game uh, so what is it nine you start off with a nine nine engine and that's basically how much power you've got power represents how many units you can transport by length per turn so you got a nine train you can transport nine units one space or you can transport one unit nine spaces or three units, three spaces. You can buy multiple trains if you want to. 
And as time goes on, you start to get bigger and bigger engines, 42, I think there's a 24 in here, all the way up to the 72. And that's determined on by what turn, because, you know, you start off, I don't even, eh, I guess they do kind of change the difference in what the trains are. But as technology goes, this game, the game takes place about 1870 is when it starts off. So the trains get, the train engines get better as you go through the years and you got to pay for them obviously yeah that is if you want to transport more costs um but yeah i mean there's no real conflict in the game unless you're <laughs> trying to screw someone out of grabbing a claim or 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 grabbing a track but i mean other than that there's it's not really a conflict driven game it's you know it's it's a co -op. it's not a co-op game but it's it's a it's a victory point game. You're racing for victory points, and I kind of dig on those sometimes, sometimes not. Um, I had a suggestion, and I'll, I'll get into more more on this. One of one of one of my fellow content creators, Deborah over at Geek Gamers, uh, she wants me to do a video on my on my favorite co-op American style or Euro style games out there. I'm going to do it, but the problem with most of those type of games, at least for me, is what I like this year is going to be different from what I like next year and is different than i liked last year or even five years ago so that's going to be a snapshot of what games i enjoy at this moment so i've got five of them and we'll, we'll go over those um but i want to do that up at the game store where we can actually show the components and get into it a little bit more but yeah this is i am mean, honestly the game is real quick i mean even playing solitaire you know five minutes a turn the biggest the, the, the most time that you're going to be taking up is re-rolling uh, the market. I mean, that's going to be the most time that you're going to spend doing as a solo player is just figuring out how, how the market fluctuates up and down. So fun little game. Like I said, it's a little, just a little bit something different from what I normally do. Uh, I just wanted to point this out and highlight this. Cause I've been talking about wanting to do this game for a while. Like I said, two reasons, three reasons. Eh, yeah. Three reasons. It's a train game. No, not Brian Train. Brian Train does fine games, but it's this is a this is a, this is a choo choo train train game. I love those, um, and it takes place in an area that I grew up around in, and I know this area. I know the history of it. You know the unsinkable Molly Brown. You know Leadville, uh, who whose husband got really rich in the mining industry, and she was on the Titanic, and she survived the Titanic sinking, and wonderful mythos and history that has grown up around her but you know it's it's I, I, we used to go vacationing at these places so i know a lot of these places so that's that's why i like and it's a quick easy solitaire game i mean honestly i can probably play an entire game in one sitting i may not do that but because i'm going to be <laughs> jabbering at you and everything but yeah we're going to give this a shot i just wanted to get kind of get get this out there it's like I don't know if, if if it's good to say that I play things other than just straight up war games uh, or not, but uh, yeah, I wanted to want to do that. We we will have something coming soon. As soon as it comes in, I don't want to say too much, but we are going to be seeing. I don't know a, a remake, a remake of something soonish. I, I, I don't know, maybe, if and when that ever comes into the store. Uh, so I think that's all I got for now. Uh, this is already a half hour. My throat is harshed out. This throat is still killing me from the weekend's allergy fest. I got something going on. I'm getting a tickle on the back of my throat. It's causing me to cough all day long. So we're going to go ahead and cut it here. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see everybody later. See ya.